Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. This is our, see it's been since 2014, we've been doing the communication symposium twice a semester and bringing in professionals like our guest today, Barbara Moore Silva from Channel 10, WJAR 10 NBC in Providence. Uh, and basically what we like to do is just give you guys a sense of people who are working in the field that some of you are studying for and some of you are in public speaking, which is always important no matter what field you go into. Uh, so pretty much I'm just going to turn the mic over to Barbara, but in case you guys haven't followed her career, I just wanted to give a little bit of a sense of who she is. Uh, Barbara and I have known each other for more years than we care to say. Correct. <laughs> but uh, basically my husband used to work in television and worked with Barbara as well, so we've been friends for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, she is now currently uh, one of the anchors on NBC10 and uh, is most known, I believe, in the field for being the health care reporter because she is so involved in the community and she's won countless awards for her uh, involvement in the community, as well as for her reporting, including Emmy Awards. Uh, she's won uh, four Emmys, which is huge, uh, as some of you guys know, as well as the Associated Press Award uh, for her work with Shaken Baby Syndrome. So again, without further ado, I am going to introduce our guest, Barbara, to give her a warm uh, welcome. I do appreciate it. Everybody get a good night's sleep? Yeah, I didn't either. So we're all on fumes this morning, right? It's all good. How many of you in here are 22 years old or younger? Wow, I started at WJAR 22 years ago. So some of you are just being born or probably weren't even born yet. So that's how long I've been at WJAR. I've been in the news business, I hate to even say this, uh, over 35 years. So I've been in the business a whole long time. At WJAR, I was hired there as a medical reporter, which I did for many, many years until my boss got this bright idea I should anchor, um, put me on the noon show, and then I did the weekend show, and then I did the morning show, and then I did the weekend show. <laughs> it's kind of like a ping pong match. I'm on the weekend show now, and I love my schedule because I work Thursday through Sunday, four 10-hour days, I put together all my medical reports, in two days, and then on the weekends in between anchoring, I put together all of my stories for the week. So that's fun. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I got there, but I'm gonna show you a series that won me actually a national award um, that I'm very proud of. It took us a while to be able to have full access to Rhode Island Hospital's ER, which is the only level one trauma center in our area. So I did a two part series there. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of my work just in case you're not familiar with it. Dab wound to the abdomen. The operating room. Chest X-ray. It's a Friday night, 11 o'clock, when we first arrive at Rhode Island Hospital's ER, and we hit the ground running. Critical care is busy right now. We just got a couple um, level 1As, which is our top trauma um, type patient that we get. They're the sickest patients. So uh, this gentleman was in a motorcycle crash earlier this evening. Motorcycle versus automobile. The police report indicates he was trapped under the car tire and that he was wearing a helmet. Thanks to the efforts of combined EMS and air transport, they actually um, saved his life. Stabilized at a Fall River hospital, then flown here. Squeeze my hand here. He remains in critical condition given the severity of his injuries. His hands are restrained so he doesn't pull his chest tube out. Squeeze my hand here. Social worker Jessica Hornig is working with his family. They're anxious, they're agitated, very nervous. We can get a little more air in his cuff too. Each of these rooms in the critical care unit of the ER is full. In some rooms there are two patients and the holding area is filling up. By this time, it's 12.45 a.m. There are accident victims, one of them severe enough to require dozens of stitches by a plastic surgeon at her bedside. There's an elderly woman with a suspected stroke. Well, her brain itself uh, looks like there's nothing acute going on. She a man is brought in so short of breath, he is gasping for air, his blood pressure through the roof. He is not being very cooperative. There's a chance I'm going to need to put a tube in your throat and breathe for you. Is that okay with you? Uh. <laughs> and there are a number of intoxicated patients, a few of them disruptive. Hey, you suck. One has to be tackled to the ground by at least four security guards. Yo, what the f are you doing? 
wheeled to a room where he has to be restrained for his safety and that of other patients and hospital staff. Then there's Luis Rosa of Providence. He actually came in as a transfer from another hospital, um, complaining of throat pain and unable to open his mouth or swallow. We're going to have our honeymoon in the hospital. <laughs> the scans show this newlywed has what is known as a retropharyngeal abscess, an infection behind the throat that is spreading. And it looks like it's filled with um, gas and uh, some fluid. So it'll be consistent with a gas producing um, abscess. Luis is in good spirits, but all indications are his infection is severe. I haven't seen an infection in that location to that extent. Meantime, a stabbing victim from New Bedford arrives. This hurts. I know. Well, we're going to take you to the operating room. Uh, I need to a stab wound to the abdomen, and despite the fact that he suffered a rather large gash and a foot of his small bowel is protruding, he is stable right now. Their bigger concern, Mr. Rosa. So now there's a team of doctors in on his case. He's already on IV antibiotics, but should he go into surgery right away, ahead of the stabbing victim? What concerns you most about Luis? Two things. One is always his airway. The second is a life-threatening condition. And in his case, this infection, if it turns out to be an infection, could have traveled to his heart rather easily. Tonight at 11, find out what happens to Luis and find out how the medical team prioritizes emergencies. That's tonight at 11 as we continue this rare look inside the ER. With this special Health Check 10 report, I'm Barbara Moore Silva, NBC 10 News. So what we wanted to do was give people an inside look at what goes in, you know, on in the ER, including the guy who was out of control. He was sitting right next to me for the longest time, just kind of like this. I got up and moved away and all of a sudden he became Superman and they had to tackle him to the ground. So a lot of scary stuff happens in the ER. That was a very special report that I did because we gave people a, a glimpse as to what goes on. So you know I'm that medical reporter, but let me tell you how I started. It was back before dirt was around. <laughs> I helped form the earth. No. No. Um, when I got started, it was actually in 1980, and I was an intern. How many of you know the importance of doing internships at wherever you are, a TV station, a hospital, whatever you want to do? Internships are invaluable. I was living in Indianapolis, Indiana, and did an internship at a station called Wish TV, which I thought was kind of cool. I worked at Cold TV and Wish TV. Did an internship there, loved it so much, I did a second semester internship. Loved it so much that I begged them to let me do on-air stuff. This is a top 20 market, which if you, there's about 20, 200 and some markets. I was working in a top 20 market doing on-air reporting as an intern, which is very embarrassing to look back at it right now. Got $25 a story, which I thought was like a windfall. But that's how I got my start. And then I went from there to Honolulu, Hawaii. How many of you have been in Hawaii? Beautiful there. Christmas in Hawaii, nothing like it. I worked in Honolulu, Hawaii. I worked in Tucson, Arizona. I worked in Decatur, Illinois. I worked in Indianapolis, Indiana. I worked in Boston. And I've worked in Providence. How many markets is that? A lot. And that's what it's like if you want to get in the news. A lot of times you have to move up. I'll have to tell you, though, at Channel 10, a lot of people there, they work there, and they never leave. How many of you know probably most of the people there? Frank Coletta? Yeah. Patrice Wood? Yeah. Frank Carpano? And on and on and on. So I came to Channel 10 thinking I'd be there like a couple of years, 22 years ago and ended up staying. How many of you guys are interested in getting into TV news? You're so smart. <laughs> because the news business is changing. How many of you are looking into getting into PR? How many of you are looking into getting into anything communications or media related? OK, so a few of you. It's very important to, oh, how to put this, if you want to get into this business, you have to work really, really hard. Um, I think a lot of people think you're going to get into this business and it's going to be easy peasy. It just isn't. If you want to get into TV news, 
It used to be where we'd have two men crew. So I'd have a photographer, an audio person, and me. That's back in the dark ages when you needed all those people. Nowadays, in TV, we have what are called one-man bands. Who knows what that is? What? It's basically one person who does everything. Absolutely. It's one person who shoots their video, who edits their video, writes their video, and presents their video. So it's very all-inclusive. Who, who wants to get into PR here? Let me tell you why PR is so important. If you're in public relations, you want coverage, right? So let me give you an insight if you want to get people to cover you. Peopleize your press releases. And make sure, and this is a stickler for me, that you get your grammar right. I have gotten some press releases that I just ignore because they're just poorly written. Um, you want to peopleize them. You want to get people who want to come out and do it. So we have some people who want to do, what are some of the other things you guys want to do in here? Public speaking? Yeah, a little. Like, what do you want to do with public speaking? Uh, uh, <laughs> um, I guess be better at it then. Uh, <laughs> That's how I feel this morning. Uh, uh, yeah. Events, I guess? Like it's, oh, you want to be an event organizer? I, the, like, rallies and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, rallies. We love rallies. And, that. I don't really want to like, do that as a living, but I want to be better at that. <laughs> right. We in the news love rallies. And there have been a lot of rallies this year, haven't there? It's been a very busy news year. I just got back from the Dominican Republic, and people, a friend of mine who's an anchor in Baltimore, Baltimore and I were on the flight, and these people from Canada said, where are you from? We said, the US. And they're like, oh, you have Trump as president. And I said, yes. And they're like, what do you do? And we're like, we're the fake news. <laughs> And they laughed because we are considered the fake news, um, which we're trying to get that taken away because we don't believe we are the fake news. How many of you believe that we are fake news? Yeah, we try and keep it, you know, fairsy squaresy. So I'm going to show you, because I was talking, you know, I'm not beyond this, when things go wrong in TV, it's a blooper. This was not a fun blooper. I have worse, and I have not so bad. But let's take a look at this one when it just went really badly. And preparing members of your home for a storm is crucial. Yeah, and that includes going through a checklist. Health Check 10 reporter Barbara Moore Silva joins us now. And Barbara, health officials are trying to make that easier for all of us. Let's take a look at it. I'm uncomfortable with this. Okay, this is the list, and what they're talking about is people need to have flashlights with batteries at work. You need to make sure your cell phones are charged and you have emergency numbers on hand, very important, and enough of any medication you may need on hand and nearby. Tina Thomas went to her eye doctor for headaches. The glasses helped, but so did the genetic testing he did for her. She never thought her eye doctor could also improve her arthritis. And it's really helped my energy level. Um, it's helped my mobility. Okay, apparently that is the wrong story. Here's the thing. Um, you need to have a lot of, you know, water on hand, the flashlights, of course. If you have elderly family members or neighbors, health officials are asking that you check on them. Coming up at 6 o'clock, we'll have more tips and we'll tell you about a registry for those with special needs. Live in the newsroom, Barbara Moore Silva, NBC10 News. But you have to take it in stride. Um, Ms. Murphy was telling me about an anchor who was fired this week. Yeah. Uh, for coming out on camera, like, what did I do now? Got fired for that. So what you do in this case is you just keep plowing through. You're like, sorry about this. And you just kind of have to know your subject matter because if I didn't know my subject matter, I wouldn't have been able to punt and talk about, oh, you need a flash eye, you need to do this, and you need to do that. And then when the eye story came up, I'm like, what is going on? This is supposed to be in health check, not in this segment. So you have to be prepared for the very worst because the very worst can happen. Um, how many of you know that we host blood drives, three blood drives a year? How many of you are blood donors? How many of you should be blood donors? 
Okay, let me show you this story because this should convince you to be a blood donor, okay? See, I have to push my health thing and I have to push people giving blood because I think this is so important. Okay, let's play this one. The NBC 10 Care Summer Blood Drive is going on right now at the Crown Plaza in Warwick. A lot of activity for this annual blood drive. NBC 10's Barbara Moore Silva is holding court tonight. She says everything is back on track, Barbara. Hi there, Alice and Jean. You know, we had a few setbacks today. The weather was beautiful. We lost power for a couple of hours, but still a lot of people did come out in part because of an Army veteran from Dyke Beach. Army veteran Greg Reynolds is celebrating his seventh alive day. It's a military term. It means the day that you were not supposed to live. So you, the chance that you get to live life again after your alive day is something that happened to you that you're not making it out of. Only he was not critically injured while serving in combat in Iraq back in 03 and 04, although bullets and explosives came close. It was while he was on his motorcycle on this date, seven years ago, he lost an arm and severed a main artery. They gave him a 1 in 2,000 chance of survival. Yes, that equals 0 .0005, so that was very highly unlikely that even to survive, but my recovery was even less than that. So to be here today to talking to you with, with you right now is just remarkable. But in order to survive, he needed 101 pints of blood. So every alive day, he donates. And this year, it's at our NBC 10 blood drive. His story attracting new donors. So Jillian, you're a first time donor. How was it? It was pretty good. And I came here out here to support Greg Reynolds. Yep. It all was going well until a power outage and subsequent fire alarms at the Crown Plaza, a delay of almost two hours. But many people waited, like Pat Pelosa. I waited because I'm doing this in memory of my son. He passed away a year ago in July, and he needed 17 blood transfusions, which he got from the blood center. So this is my way of giving back. So I'm going to open it up for questions because I don't know what any of you guys want to know about what I do or anything. So who has questions? Can we just ask, uh, if someone has a question, raise your hand and wait for me. I will bring the mic so everyone here in the room can hear what the question is. So, What was your like toughest story for you personally to do? Because I know news is hard to Yeah, you know, I think the, the toughest one was when I was in Tucson, Arizona. And we had to cover a cult church out in the middle of nowhere. Ooh, fun. Yeah, it was not fun. <laughs> and we were across the highway from the church, and all of a sudden, my photographer, Jamie, was out there videotaping, and I'm in the driver's seat, and this woman comes knocking on my window and says, get out of there, you know, wanted to do physical harm. Meantime, my photographer's still shooting, and all of a sudden they're coming across with like all kinds of like hammers and different things. I'm freaking out. I don't know what to Jesus. do. So Jamie's like, do this. So I'm like driving the car real slow so he can try and catch up to the car. We're trying to get away from them chasing us. And finally he was able to get in the car. I don't even know how we did this. And I just tore off. And then I became the story because all the other TV stations wanted to interview me. And now I realize how hard it is to be interviewed. It's easy to interview, but to be interviewed is really tough because I'm like, I, uh, then I, I hit the gas and um, I was really scared, you know. I, I mean, it was, and then I'm sitting here saying, can I do it again, can I do it again? <laughs> because I didn't like what I was saying because I was freaking out. So I, I know when some of you get interviewed, you might be, but we're uh, Memorex, so we can do it over and over until you get it right. So that was probably the scariest incident because I thought I was going to die. And then I had to go to court and testify against them. So I had to have you know, police you know, making sure that they didn't come into my apartment at night. It was just a very scary time. Got through it, still here. And I don't know what happened to that cult. I don't want to know. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. I don't know if you've already like said this, so I apologize, but how did you break into the industry? I broke into the industry as an intern. I went to Indiana University. Um, it's actually Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis, so IUPUI. Um, and I was one of the first, the inaugural members of the telecommunications class. There were eight of us, and I was one of them. There's like a picture in the office at IUPUI. That's how old I am. So we were one of the inaugural people, so we had to do internships. I did an internship at a radio station. 
I did an internship at a newspaper, but it was the internship at the TV station that really captured my interest because I'm definitely ADHD. I love to just you know keep moving and doing different things. And the first thing they had me do was scanner patrol. You know what that is? Where you listen to the scanners. And after a while, it's like, I can't listen to the scanners anymore. It's like, you know, code red, code red, you know, accident here, let's get there. And I'm, you know, after, but that was the best training ever. Because it, you know, on the weekends when we have a minimal crew, I'm way over here and our scanners are here. And I'm like, was that a fire? You know, just because you can just start picking it up. So I did my internship there, and I did another internship there, and then I conned them into paying me $25 a story. Um, and I'm glad I don't have those tapes here because um, I have big hair and like over enunciated and was not natural. And I learned in this business, you need to keep it real and be natural. You know, how you talk on TV, you know, you don't want to go to the Ted Baxter, you know, school of television and talk like this. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Moore Silva, and you're not. <laughs> so you want to be able to be natural. And that's what I've learned over the years, believe it or not, is to be yourself when you mess up. And trust me, there, I could show you bloopers where you'd be like on the floor crying from laughing so hard. Um, you just you have to suck it up and just go on. Because we all, we all make mistakes in real life, right? We're talking and we're like, eh, 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 we can't get it out. Do people sit here and say, eh, I'm not talking to you now because you can't get it out? You know, you just, you, this is, you, you have to be yourself when you do this job and not zone out like the anchor who was apparently fired this week Australia. by, huh? She was in Australia. Was Australia. You know, you know, where you're like, I'm on TV. So, yeah, that's how I got my start, the long version. Yeah. Uh, what made you what made you go into this industry? Like when you were a child, what, did you have like a passion for like news? Did you have like a very social person, very interactive? You know, what made you get into it in general? Did you watch the news a lot? <laughs> yeah, I kinda had to, my parents did. Um, no, I originally wanted to be a ballet dancer, but I had two left feet. Seriously, I walk into things. And <laughs> Uh, seriously, then I wanted to be an actress. I was a theater major, and then I decided I wanted to eat. So then I did this. <laughs> and anyone who's an aspiring actress would know what I'm talking about. They're just, you know, yeah, there you go. Just very few jobs, and the ones you might get in community theater, or if you're one in a gazillion and you make it on the big screen, you want to try and keep making it on the big screen. So I wanted to eat. So when I, it was my internships that decided what I wanted to do. Because that's, I think that's why you do internships, is you can either decide, I'm not doing this because it's horrifying, or I'm doing this because I have a passion for doing this. And I quickly got grabbed into, snatched into this snarl of medianess, and still here, 35 years later, even though I'm only 35. <laughs> I know, hard to believe. I think for everyone here, um, internship is, is a really great place to start. But once you're done with your internship, finding a job and actually accomplishing that. What are the best ways to go about that and some of the hardest things that you have to deal with? Finding a job is a job. And you have to realize when you're looking for a job, be ready for no, 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 possibly, but no. Be ready for rejection after rejection. Some of you will not get a rejection letter. Some of you will be hired right off the bat. But most people get a no, no, no. So you need to have tenacity. You have to really want to do something. I was on my 50th no letter. That's back when they actually wrote letters and mailed them out. Um, that's actually when we put tapes in you know, envelopes and mailed those out. Um, I got so many rejection letters. And then I remember I moved from Indianapolis, where I lived, to California on a whim. Met a guy, moved there. And I'm there working as an administrative assistant, secretary. Um, at this office, and I get a call from Tucson, Arizona. I never got a no from them, never got anything from them. And the news director has me on the phone, and he says, I really like your tape. And I said, oh, thank you. He goes, what are you doing now? Oh, I'm a secretary. And he hired me on the phone. 
which is weird. After like 50 rejection letters and then 50 I didn't hear from at all, he actually hired me on the phone. I went to work there and that's kind of how I got started. You know, somebody took a chance on me after all of those rejection letters. And even after you get your first job, the rejections are still out there. You know, you want to move up, you know, don't lose hope. When you lose hope, then you might as well just stay where you are. So I, I just say keep trying, put your best foot forward, make your, your cover letter succinct, you know, to the point. Watch out for grammatical errors. I'm telling you, news directors or wherever you're going, look for those things. They want people who are high performing. And when you're, you have a lot of competition out there, there's a lot of competition, you know, you have to really bring your A game. But just don't give up. If you really want something, you're going to get it. I really, really believe that. It might not be where you want it, but you'll get it. You get experience, and then you go on. So don't give up. Who, who got that message? Back there, you got the message, thanks. Hi, I actually have two questions. Mm -hmm. The first question is, are we going on TV? <laughs> I know it's low camera. No. <laughs> um, and the second question is, what are your plans for the future? What are my plans for the future? Oh god, I'm old as dirt. Um, I'm actually working on my third novel. So that's what I'd like to be as a novelist. I have, have I printed anything new? Have I tried to market them? No. But I am working on my third novel. My first one is called The Love Basket, based on a true story of a woman who was abused. Um, my second story is Brunch and Football. It's intrigue and drama and trauma. Seven women, two gays get together every week and, <laughs> and share recipes and trouble. And then the third one that I'm currently working on might be my favorite. It's called And That's Why I Color My Hair. And I play a TV news reporter. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm, that's what I'd like to be when I grow up, is a, t is, a, is a novelist. So you don't want to stay in the news? Well, I'll stay in a few more years. Yeah, I do want to stay in the news. I have, I, to me, I have the best job. I have the best job, the best hours, I, the best friends at work. I mean, we really are a dysfunctional family, but we're a family. You know, like RJ and I are always, you know, kidding, you know, we're married. <laughs> that kind of thing. So, yeah. So, I was interested in your comment that you are fake news. <laughs> and I was wondering if you just said it as a joke. I did say it as a joke. And what but it's not so much of a joke to our president who thinks we are fake news. That's only one individual. Correct. So I say it as a joke. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And I was wondering what you do, because to me it's not a joke. It's a sin. It is a sin. It's, it's horrible. It's, it's the destruction of our country. It, and I'm wondering you, as a news reporter, and the people that you work with, I realize you have to be respectful mm -hmm. and stay within the law. But what you do, rather, other than joke, to combat that image? I think we just try to do our job as fairly as we can. As a medical reporter, you know, I try to do, well, I do as much research as I can, and I also give the caveat that one, um, one treatment might work for one and not for another. In our general news department, our whole mantra is, we're owned by Sinclair Broadcast, and their mantra is that you, you keep it fair, you have both sides, you have to have both sides. I don't see that on all networks, sadly. Some are skewed one way and some are skewed another way. Our mantra is we have to get both sides or at least make that effort to get the other side and let people know that we did try to get that other side. So that's where we try to keep it real and real news. We've always been about real news. Always been about real news. But you mentioned on air, I don't watch that much news, but I don't really hear the news people address the issue by repeating that phrase. Which I think is blocked. We would never say that on the air, yeah. ever, ever. So you just present both sides and let people make their own. That's own. exactly what we do. Now, do we get emails into the station calling us fake news? Absolutely. You're I, I swear to God. What do they use for evidence? They don't. There's never any evidence. Okay, there's one other question, if you don't mind. Um, when you went to the, you said a cult church? Yes. Did you ask them if you could come to interview them? We were across the street. We were not on their property. No, but 
We were to, we were trying to get them to come talk to us. The question was, did you tell them you were coming or ask for an interview? No. What was happening? Let me let me give you the backstory on this so you know why why we were there. There were people. I'm not saying that's wrong. Just right. There were people being held inside of their that church against their will. I should have told you the backstory. So we were all there covering it. All there was a line of media from Tucson and Phoenix covering this one story. So that is why we were there in the first place. We didn't know we would become part of the news story. So. Yeah, thank you very much, because I think that's part of the news' job, is to help further justice in the country. Absolutely, and, and I'm glad you asked for that clarification. And we always do try to get the other side. Um, I know sometimes it looks like we're, you know, they're being very pushy trying to, to, to get the other side. But that's oftentimes when people refuse to talk to us, and we're just trying to be fair and get their side. And if they still, and if they still refuse to talk to us, there's not much we can do. How do you stay informed on the news and current events? How do I what? How do you stay? How do you stay informed on the news and current events? I read a lot, and I watch TV a lot. Um, I'm always online checking to see what's going on. We have a news feed at work. That gives us all the breaking news. Um, when there was the school shooting in San Bernardino yesterday, um, you know, anytime there the Sweden attack, um, just all of those come over on my. I carry my cell phone with me all the time. Those come over as breaking news. So as soon as I see something like that and I'm, and I'm off, I will go to the television set or I'll Google to get more information because it's always being updated through AP or through television, and I'll switch around to different networks just to try to get different angles on it, but that's how we stay informed. I mean, do we know everything new? You know, there are things, you know, I was in the Dominican Republic, came back, knew nothing about what was going on, and found out, you know, what went on um, in Syria when I got back. I was just appalled, um, but had no idea that had gone on. We got back um, the night that President Trump decided to bomb there. So we don't always know. We're not always in communication with what's going on, but we try to stay up to date best, as best we can. I know that in the news you were talking about like, being like, fair, always like, having both sides. Like, when you started like, doing like, your stories and stuff, was it hard to be like, objective? Or did that take time to, like, because like, I'm sure that you have your own opinion about like We all have biases. Yeah. Every single person in this room has a bias, right? Whether you like to admit it or not. Um, no, you know how we keep it real and honest in the newsroom is we have someone read our script. And I've had this happen where they read the script and they're like, you forgot this because I get so intense in writing my story that sometimes I forget, oh yeah, there's this, or they need to know this. And they're like, they'll ask questions. And I'm like, oh God, and this is the most obvious thing I should have had in there. So I always tell people, always have another set of eyes reading what you write. So they can ask questions. I'll read some other people's scripts, and I ask a question, you know, why didn't he do that? And then they answer it and put it in your script. So that's how we make sure that things are fair. Um, if there's something that is really touchy, we get our lawyers involved. We do not want a lawsuit. We hate lawsuits. Um, so we get our attorneys involved when there's something um, that's a, a bit controversial. So we try to cover all bases and make sure we don't get those lawsuits. And has there, sorry, um, has there been like, um, a, like a topic or something like that that you didn't want to report on because you felt like so strongly about, like the opposite view or something like that? Or? Nothing where I said I wasn't going to cover it. There are a lot of things I do, do have a strong viewpoint on, but you just have to go in there and say, and that's when I think you do a better job of getting both sides, because you know where your heart is and what you think. So you want to make sure you get that other side so you don't have that bias there. And we do play off each other in the newsroom. We ask, you know, what do you think about this? Is, does, this make me, does this make the story look biased? Does this, you know, we kind of bounce things off of other people in the newsroom because we want to make sure we get the best product on the air. Obviously the changes in technology, social media, um, you know, you've said for many years now, 24 seven news cycle. How has that impacted how you report uh, from when you started to today? Oh, huge. Back when I started, we didn't have cell phones. <laughs> Seriously, I got a first, my first bag phone, 
you, you have to be of a certain age to know what a bag phone is. It's when you carry it over your shoulder um, and you thought you were special. Um, it's evolved so much so that we are required to be on social media. We're required to be on Twitter and Facebook and tweet about our stories and get people engaged in wanting to watch the news and see what's coming up. We put things on Facebook. This is what's coming up tonight at 5.30 or this is what's coming up on Saturday night at 6, 7, and 11. So we're always out there engaging the, you know, our audience to want to watch that, want to watch us. So it's become so important that it's part of our job now. It's not even do it if you want. It is like a priority in your job. Get the story, get the story right, and tweet about it and put it on Facebook. And we're, you all know about Facebook Live. I'm so bad at that, but still, I'm like all this way and, but I still try and do it. Um, and they're really big into Facebook Lives. I did, the, the, ah, did one this weekend. Um, with Joe Chiata in sports, what's going on there, what's going on with RJ, what's going on in news. And, you know, people were engaging, you know, saying, oh, hey, I love RJ, hey, you, love you know. So this is how you engage people and let them know what's going on behind the scenes. So, yeah, it's, I, I think it's paramount these days in this business to be very apt <laughs> at social media. One of the best people there is Patrice Wood. She is on Twitter all the time. Like, girl, she's on all the time. So, and she's older than me, which is way older than Dirk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we always tease each other, me and Patrice. But uh, yeah, we're, it's kind of, it's a requirement to be on social media. <laughs> Can you share with the students what your workflow is like? So what is a typical day? Yeah, okay. Are you getting into work? How That's a good question. I'm kind of um, on an island by myself. We have an assignment desk that assigns people to certain jobs. I do my own assignments, unless they want a special report on something and they come to me. But I, you know, people email me with story ideas. I hear about them. I see something coming on the feed. I'm like, let's do this locally. Um, so what I'm doing on Thursdays, Fridays, honestly, I'm doing it throughout the week. Like I have my phone with me today and I'm setting up stories today. Um, and I set up all my stories for Thursday, Friday. I shoot three stories one day, two stories another. So I have those two stories, and then I have Monday, Tuesday. So it looks like I'm there all the time. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I'm back Thursday again, and then so on and so forth. So it is, it's a lot of work, because you're trying to set up interviews. You know, I'm, I used to have a producer, which was awesome, but I don't now, so I carry around my iPad and hope I don't double book, which I've done. It's not a pleasant thing. Um, so that's what my day is. It, it's pretty busy, and I pretty much let them know what I need for a photographer. So that is, that is my day. And then on the weekends, I edit these stories. I write and edit them in between um, anchoring shows. So it's fun. Yes? First of all, I'd like to thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to come to Bristol Community College sure. today and talk to our students. One of the things that I try to stress in my public speaking class is that public speaking is so applicable through so many different types of disciplines. My question to you is, I noticed that during the emergency room video, you interviewed a lot of different people, and the public is very sensitive about confidentiality right now. How were you able to subvert the HIPAA laws and confidentiality within a medical setting? And how much work was involved to actually produce that segment and overcome all of the hospital rules and the laws with the background in producing that particular video? We didn't bypass any HIPAA laws whatsoever. The people you actually saw on the air signed off on it. The people, a lot of them, you saw them blurred they didn't sign off on it. So every, and this went through a lot of hoops. I had to edit it, we had to send it to the hospital. They had to look at it and make sure just someone way in the background, and they caught some things that I even missed. Very few, but they did catch some things. So everything was carefully looked at because we did not want a lawsuit from anyone, nor did the hospital, we would be doubly sued. So we made sure to get um, slips, permission slips from everyone whose face was shown. The doctors, nurses were all okay, but the patients, uh, Luis, uh, the young man we showed there, we had to get him to sign off on it. Um, 
And by the way, in part two, he was brought into surgery before the guy with the stab wound where half of his abdomen was hanging out because he could have died from an infection that could have gone to his heart. But yeah, that is so carefully policed. And I am so HIPAA savvy because that's what I do all the time that when we go into hospitals, they know I'm not going to show people um, inadvertently even. I edit all my own stuff, so I make sure that if the photographer inadvertently got someone in the background, I don't use it. So that's how we got it. That took so many hours, so many hours to put that together. Days, weeks. <laughs> and the landscape of journalism has changed and become more electronic. Could you just tell our students which types of technical skills and which types of software would they be responsible for if they also wanted to be a news reporter? I tell you, it changes all the time. We've had like four editing systems in the last couple of years. And I'm inept when it comes to electronics and learning, but I've learned it. So you have to pick up on this. No, it, like channel 12, 6, 10, I think we have different editing bays there and different editing systems, which makes it more challenging and they're always upgrading it. And we'll start with like iNews, go to Edius, go back to iNews, go, we change and go back and forth and we just have to keep up with it. Um, the good thing is, is you get trained to use all of this. You guys have those, those smart young minds. My kids are always programming all my stuff for me. So you guys can go in there and probably easily pick up any of this. It's nothing that's you know very, very hard. But it, you do have to keep up with it. And that's why I choose to edit my own stories. And I, and I say I choose because I want to make myself more valid in this business, more needed, you know. Keep me, please, <laughs> because I have all these different skills. So the more skills you have, the better off you are. And if you plan on getting into TV, make sure you can shoot, edit, write, you know, camera ready, all of that. Those are the jobs that are out there right now for people just out of college. And Thank you so much. Be prepared to be in a very small market. Actually, I have a question. You had mentioned taking that the hospital uh, also looked at that story before it ran, which is in my experience, not one of the more normal things. I teach both the news writing class and the PR class. And one thing I always talk about the news writing class is you make sure you get it accurate, you get all the sides, just like you're talking about, but you don't have the source approve the story. Okay, can, can we I talk tell about you, the I, difference yes. on that? Because I think let me get... tell you what happened there. The agreement was they couldn't change what I wrote or any of the interviews. All they could do was to police it to make sure everyone who was seen in that video was permissioned to be in that video. So they could not, even if they, there was, I think in part two, where we, the doctors were fighting over what to do. And we showed that on TV. They, they I shouldn't say fighting, they disagreed on what to do. And we made that clear, that they weren't on the same page, and finally they came together kumbaya and, you know, took Louise in. So they could not change that, even though they probably did not want that look out there. That's what came out there. So the agreement was, and you're right, we normally don't even run anything by anyone, but this one actually took two years to get Rhode Island Hospital on board. They had to go through lawyers. I had to go in and do testing and go through, you know, all of this, you know, different things to be able to, and I had to wear a badge. And uh, so it was very extensive to be able to get in there in the first place. But no, it, the agreement was, will change things if that person isn't or person or persons aren't supposed to be in there but they could not change anything we wrote and that's your thank right. you for that's, that distinction that I just is want to so make it clear. important because nobody should be telling us how to do our job and we're going to keep it real we're going to show what really happens and that was the whole idea behind doing this i got got a question um let's say let's say you could you commit a crime right um, if you're under the age of 18, can you can you still post somebody's picture on the internet if they committed no. a crime? You're not supposed to. No. So you, if like, but if you do commit a crime and you're 18, your your picture can be you, posted we, on we'll like, Facebook. We'll right? plaster it all over. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's <laughs> it's just how it is. You're not supposed to um, yeah. put anyone who's a juvenile their picture up unless the court says you can. You know, it's that big enough of a case. If you're 18 or over, we're, we're going to own you. 
<laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> Have you ever been put in the position where someone did try to file a lawsuit against like any of the stories that you wrote? That I wrote? No. Or that anybody in your Well, news yeah, anchor? we've had lawsuits. Uh, all right. <laughs> we've had lawsuits. Uh, like, did you ever have to like go into a courtroom and like testify or ever like talk about what Well, happened? I had to testify in that Tucson case just because they attacked oh, us, yeah. but okay. I've never had to, I've never been sued. Maybe because I've been covering health and I haven't done anything egregious, so. That's always a good thing, right? Yeah. But no, I've never been sued, All thankfully. Right. But yeah. we've had some um, pretty high-profile lawsuits against us, Jim Terracani being one of them. Wow. Our first speaker, or one of our first yeah. He's, it, his is a riveting tale, and he's just amazing. He's amazing. Uh, yeah. All hail to Jim. You said that you were an actress at one point, and I think that um, finding the balance between being real and being way too articulate Definitely your youngest pieces are going to be the worst evidence against your job. Yes, it is. Do you think that acting is the best skill set for you to embark on to be able to find that balance between real and articulate? Or is I it something else? I think acting, public speaking, anything like that where you're in front of people. I tend to be very, you know, visual, you know, and, and some people like, I make faces sometimes on the air, you know, I'm like this. Well, you saw one of them. Yeah. Um, it, because that's how I am in real person, you know. I'm, acting is a is a is a good field to be in. I, is it a prerequisite to getting into TV? Absolutely not. It just it doesn't hurt. Um, I still act, by the way, little small parts and little community theaters, and and it's still fun. I played a Jewish mother not too long ago in the December Rabbi. Just a shameless plug for that play. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I still act just because I love that. And I think acting also gives you those, those skills you might need if you're in a, a pickle. You know, if something goes, as we call it, the jet, do you smell the jet fuel? The plane goes down. You have to be ready to respond to that plane going down. So I think it kind of gives you those coping skills um, where you can kind of laugh it off, not laugh it off in a, appropriately on a serious story, but to just pick it up and know it's not the end of the world. Because as you saw in that story, I could have crumbled or somebody new might have been out there and said, why is this story coming up in the middle and what do I do? And, and then it comes back and you're like, okay. <laughs> that would have been the younger Barbara. I've done that before. I call it deer in the headlights. So Sitting here, okay, back to you. Don't know what I'm doing. Bye. So, we, you grow. You grow. Whether you do PR, whether you do whatever you do in life, you grow in that field. If you don't, then you probably shouldn't be in that field. So, I, one of these days, I'm going to dig up some of my old stuff. My hair was like this, and <laughs> I don't. I can't explain it. It was just, yeah, early stuff. So Barbara, you made some refer a reference Jim Terracani, and it was funny because I was going to bring that up. He was one of our speakers here mm -hmm. at the Communication Symposium. And at that time, he talked about the threat to journalism and the value of journalism in the democracy. And it's kind of ironic that here we are now. He was talking about the, the uh, Federal Reporter Shield Law at that time, mm -hmm. that you couldn't be forced to testify and give up confidential sources. Your sources, yeah. We talk here in the college a lot about information literacy about students being able to not just take one side of a story but really seek others. With what's going on in these worlds in the world right now, I kind of like your perspective on how do we keep reporting real in a democracy and what are some of the threats to that right now? I, I really think we need to be more cohesive as journalists. I don't think we're as cohesive as we should be. Um, journalists have been kicked out of press conferences. CNN was kicked out. Yet other people stay in those press conferences. I don't know if I would want to stay if you're kicking out one of my colleagues for whatever reason, whatever reason you want to come up with. I think we need to do a better job of sticking together. I don't think we're doing that right now. I think, I think journalists, and, and I, I don't want to word this incorrectly, but I, I think now more than ever we need to grow more of a backbone when we cover stories and, and be tenacious and not be afraid of asking questions, not back down. A lot of journalists are backing down now um, and, and we can't do that. 
So that's kind of the short answer to that. I don't want to get too involved with that because you know that could be controversial in and Absolutely. of itself. But it is certainly part of the issue. It is part of the issue. We kind of back down and we don't we don't question any authority when a certain person or persons are kicked out of a press conference. That should never happen. Should never happen. It's freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and sadly we're not seeing enough of it. Any other questions? Uh, uh, you just talked about being controversial. Um, sometimes I think that stories should be a little controversial in order for you to get, you know, in order to be, you know, to think about it. Um, have you ever um, sort of been controversial just so that people should think about it? Personally, not so much. But in our newsroom, absolutely. You have to be controversial. You have to be able to report on those difficult stories. A lot of them are lawyered. We have to be lawyered these days because everyone wants to file a lawsuit. Everyone wants to file a lawsuit, especially if you have deep pockets. And a lot of the, the communications uh, the corporations have deep pockets. So we have to be so very careful because we can lose our job if we overstep our boundaries and are not fair. And literally, when a lawyer looks at something, we cannot change a word because every word is there for a reason. So we do controversial stories at Channel 10 all the time, but we make sure, you know, not to say we haven't been sued, but we try to make sure that our T's are crossed, our I's are dotted, um, and it's lawyered. So, yes. So, I know it's been great, kind of like overkill about the fake news, but what, have you guys been doing anything to sort of have people think of it as a different way than Trump is? putting it out there for people to think of it in the way that he wants people to think of it? No, I, I think we just continue to do our job. We, we don't veer from anything. We don't, we, don't even, we don't even refer to it right. in the business because then that might give it some legitimacy. Some power over. We don't want it. It has right. no power. We continue to do the job we've always done, fairly report. If people want to say we are fake news and we've gotten those emails, right. you know, they can. But if they look at the story and its merits, we are telling the story. Somebody called in. Um, be, went after Trump's uh, health care bill was, you know, knocked down. And we said that. And they said, no, you are lying. That's fake news. It was postponed. I said, no, it was not postponed. He's got to start all over. It's, it's, it's dead. And the person wanted to argue with me. I said, okay, well, thank you. Have a nice day. Right. Because I can't, you can't argue with people who don't want to listen to the merits of a story. Right. I wonder what would happen if like you just you kind of like would take a stand against it and just not report it. Like what would he say then if you just didn't give him the mind like the time of day like okay, we're fake. We're you not mean gonna... not report any news? No, I don't mean like any news just involving what he would say is fake. Like okay, if you think it's fake, we're just not going to well, we won't give you the time of day to make you feel give you the power to, to say we're fake, you know? But there's always going to be someone who's going to report on it, right. and then you lost out on reporting right. on it. So, you know, the competition thing? Yeah, um, So you kind of have to report on everything. Right. You know, like the whole controversy over were there more people at his inauguration than Obama's? Did he have the most people ever at his inauguration? And we showed pictures side by side that showed clearly not, but then we became fake news because we're showing <laughs> them, you know, either before or after when people had disseminated. Right. So, you know, we just continue to do our job. Right. That's all we can do. We continue to do our job. I don't think you're fake news. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we try not to be. That's our goal in life. Private life and public life. Could you educate us on the ideas of how much of an effect that your private life, such as what, you know, as starting off looking for a job, what you have on your Facebook can hinder? Huh. Yeah. That's a big one. <laughs> or oh, even boy. just in general now, as because you are such a major public figure, what, how you go through with your private life. First of all, I post nothing political 
on my personal or, or um, you know, work Facebook. I just don't. People have gotten fired for doing that. Um, so I just stay away from it because if they can access your work Facebook, they can access your private Facebook to some extent. You have to, if, especially if you're looking for a job, watch what you put on social media, even if it's Twitter or what's that one Snapchat where it goes away after a second? Yeah, people, yeah, people snap those shots, okay? And they save them. Those things can come back to haunt you. I can tell you this, a lot of employers go on Facebook and check your Facebook pages if you're applying for a job. They want to see what type of person you are. What are you posting? Posting pictures of your cat? All good. <laughs> posting pictures of your child? Good too. Posting anti-Trump stuff or anti-Clinton stuff or, anti or protest stuff? Not good. They don't want any of that controversy. People in this industry have gotten fired for things they thought were benign on Facebook. Don't make anything, don't put anything controversial on there, especially don't slam other people. I've had friends go on there saying, I'm going through a divorce, I hate her, she's this and that. I'm like, really, you put that on Facebook because people can read this and you might not get a job. So you just really have to watch what you put on social media because I can guarantee you, these employers or prospective employers are checking your social media to see what type of person you are. And once you have a job, keep it the same way. Unless you can make your, your Facebook page uber private and no one can see anything. Can you give our public speaking students some advice on how you overcome speech anxiety? You know what, I don't think you ever do. <laughs> I'm a theater major and that's what always fuels me to do better is having, not anxiety, but that you know anticipation, ooh, I've gotta get up and speak. You want to have a little bit of that, or you might be a little blah, a little flat. Um, but you know, I think the more you do it, and also, when I was in college, we taped ourselves public speaking, like you're taping me now. Um, so we could look at ourselves and see how we're doing out there. Are we communicating well? Are we saying um too much? We all say um, but are you saying it too much? Are you saying like too much? Are you saying whatever too much? So it's, I think it's a good idea to critique yourself, get yourself on tape. But I think it's, always, it's normal to have just a little bit of, not anxiety, but a little butterflies in your stomach before you get out there. Because I don't know you, you don't know me. And it can be intimidating when you're speaking in front of people um, be just because they might be judging you. Are you judging me? No. I feel like I'm being judged. Yeah. But. <laughs> But I think it, it just takes practice getting up and speaking in front of groups of people. I've been doing it for years, so even when I mess up, I'm like, sorry, messed up. It, it just takes practice. And don't be alarmed if you get those butterflies in your stomach every time you get up and speak because that is normal. And sometimes it gives you that added fuel to do even better. But you don't need to have anxiety. Are we good? Solid? One last chance. All right, Barbara, thank you. Thank you. You guys are awesome.